Thank you very much, Maria. So, uh, during this presentation, we're going to talk about uh, a work that we are, the, um, an interface, actually, a graphical interface that we are uh, developing here in order to properly support the segmentation of uh, uh, images in particular. Uh, this is motivated by, as you probably know, I mean, during the last decades, we had uh, uh, a lot of new instruments providing a huge amount of data, uh, which clearly it's uh, a very good thing because you, uh, you can uh, definitely um, obtain a much better knowledge about the reality. You can uh, try to um, have good interpretation about events and so on. Uh, however, uh, this also um, leads you to some uh, to some issues related to the analysis of this data. So uh, we do need possibly some kind of uh, uh, automatic or semi-automatic tools that allow us to uh, ease in some way our understanding of these images, our analysis of these images. Uh, I guess that you may probably be already quite familiar with the idea of big data, and so this is actually what we are talking about. So we would like to uh, get some ways in order to ease our analysis of this big data. So here we also have a question, so too big or not too big, that is the question. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so likely speaking, uh, a lot of our uh, data are actually can actually be thought as images, or if you prefer, even a raster or whatever. But the point is that um, we do need, uh, since typically we do use uh, artificial intelligence tools, uh, machine learning, and deep learning tools in order to analyze these images. We do typically need uh, quite large data sets in order to properly train these tools. Uh, unfortunately, generating the data sets that we're going to use in order to uh, train these tools, it's quite time consuming. This typically requires the presence of a lot of work by means of human operator. And despite this in some sense, uh, it's quite a standard way to do it. It's still something that it's not really so, so nice to do, so typically quite annoying. And so the idea here is that of supporting this human operator in such a way that, uh, that these operations, this, this labeling is, sti is still going to be uh, probably quite an annoying procedure, but faster is possible and impossibly and also uh, more accurate if something um, can also um, enable some kind of uh, semi-automatic analysis of, you know, of, of the image itself. So um, we are quite lucky because during the last decades we, had, uh, we have a lot of, uh, of tools that have been developed in order to make image analysis. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, we are going to explore, in, in general, we would like to explore the potential of also the new methods such as um, deep learning and so on. And as I told you, uh, what we are going to talk about is trying to ease the generation of, uh, of a ground truth data set in order to uh, properly support uh, the learning part of this of these uh, artificial intelligence based tools. Okay, so uh, just to summarize, what we are going to talk is trying to generate the ground truth data that we are trying to ease the generation of um, ground truth data. So all of the labeling part and all of the segmentation and labeling part, part of the work. Uh, and since usually a lot of human interaction is required, what we would like to have is something like uh, making it faster, and so the faster the better. Um, we are going to make some assumptions. So first, we are going to assume that we are going to work with uh, UAS uh, images. So this actually means that we're going to have a lot, we typically are going to have a lot of redundancy between uh, our data because uh, usually we acquire uh, 
uh, for example, an image every second or something similar. So typically you have a lot of overlapping between this data and so also a lot of, a lot of redundancy that we are going to exploit in, uh, in whatever we are going to show in the, in the next slides. Uh, furthermore, we are also assuming that we do have some multispectral information, so we're going to deal with multispectral images. And in particular, we're going to make, to make an implicit assumption that is that the objects of our interest can be in some way distinguished from, uh, from each other by means, uh, and in particular from whatever is not of our interest, by means of their uh, spectral signature. This is not so surprising, it's something that is done quite uh, in a standard way, but it's, uh, it's quite important with respect to what we are going to see in the next slides. Um, this in some way, this last, the, last, uh, the last assumption can also be summarized, if you like, as everything you do is a signature of yourself. Or if you prefer, everything I do, especially during this presentation, I'm going to do it for you. Okay, uh, so just to make the things clear, uh, we are going to consider with the motivation, the real motivation of this work is that we collected a lot of images uh, in order to make uh, plastic object detection in a flavial environment. So our original idea was that of properly dealing with this kind of images. So uh, we started developing this kind of interface in order to help ourselves to produce uh, the ground truth data for uh, properly training a machine learning tool for the classification of uh, for the, de the plastic detection of, of object for the detection of plastic objects in this kind of problem. Uh, so you, as you can see in this slide, actually we what we use is uh, um, a multispectral camera, the Maya camera, uh, in the Sentinel-2 configuration. Uh, so we use actually nine bands, nine multispectral channels, and we mounted this camera on a, on a matrix of 300, and we collected something like some thousands of images uh, of plastic objects in, uh, in, uh, uh, on the Arno River in, this, uh, in, in the example that we are looking at in, uh, in this slide. So the real motivation is first try to help ourselves in, uh, in making this thing. So what we've, what, we, what we've started to do is developing uh, this graphical user interface. The graphical user interface that we're developing is in MATLAB. Well, uh, the first question in your mind is probably right now, the MATLAB is definitely not a free tool. Uh, however, uh, most of, uh, uh, well, most of, uh, of universities and uh, in the academic institutions um, we typically do have uh, a MATLAB license, so the idea here is that of uh, providing a freely downloadable tool with uh, whatever, with all of the source code and whatever, uh, for a software which actually, for a programming language which actually is not, a, cannot be open in any way right now. However, you, you can still, it's still free in some sense for uh, academic use, so uh, that is the reason why, well, obviously we also do it in this way because we are quite familiar with uh, this kind of programming language, so that is the reason why we started doing it in this way. Um, so in the next slides, we are going to focus on uh, the free kind of operations that are typically, that can typically be done uh, by, the, by the guy, so, the first operation is just related to the visualization of the data. The second one is related to the, to the segmentation. And uh, in the third case, uh, we are just going to talk about the object classification. And in particular, we are mostly going to focus on the second step, so on the segmentation step. Uh, well, for, for, for what concerns uh, viewing uh, the visualization of the imagery, well, this is quite standard, so we can Typically, we provided the, the possibility of making uh, quite standard operations, such as, uh, well, obviously, selecting the data set, uh, navigating the data, zooming, shifting, whatever, oh, changing the visible channels, and so on. So all of these are quite standard operations, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. 
Um, so instead of what concerns the segmentation, so we distinguish it between editing an already existing object and uh, instead uh, making a new, in inserting information about a new object. Uh, so, okay, so in order to consider this thing, first we should make an assumption. So here uh, we assume that the objects can be distinguished by, by properly defining a, a mask on uh, each, of the, uh, each of our images. And D in particular, um, uh, it's quite important, it's worth to notice that currently, uh, according to our assumptions, if we have two overlapped objects, even if they are different from each other, we actually do not distinguish between the two of them. This means that we do only have uh, one mask for each images, and if we have two overlapping objects, we are just going to consider them as just one object. Uh, this is clearly a limitation. We are also thinking about extending the thing, uh, extending this kind, so generalizing a little more uh, this kind of thing. Uh, actually, generalizing a little bit more means, in some sense, uh, uh, changing from a binary mask uh, to an indexed mask uh, with different numbers and so on, depending on the object that we are considering. But by the way, for now, we are just making this kind of assumption. Okay, so we've also developed different, different so quite a lot of tools in order to support this, um, the segmentation, the manual segmentation of the objects. Uh, and also some semi-automatic tools that we're going to talk in a minute. Uh, as you can see, the list uh, of the tools is uh, relatively long. I mean, not really incredibly long, but it's re relatively long. We are just going to focus on uh, the three, four tools which are in some way uh, more remarkable. So let's first uh, start with the more obvious, obvious ones. So in particular, the free end selection. Here, there's nothing really so surprising. So you can uh, just uh, select uh, with a standard free end tool uh, the object, each of the objects of your interest. So I'm not going to uh, provide too many details about it because it's pretty obvious. And also, uh, we supported the pixel, the, uh, each pixel selection. So in this case, just by mouse clicking, you, you can directly select or unselect the pixels of your interest. Uh, this typically can be thought as an operation just to slightly modify an object that you have already defined. Okay, so uh, it's pretty clear that the two, two, uh, the, the two tools that we have just talked about are quite obvious, so let's move on uh, something a bit more uh, reasonable, at least a, a bit more interesting. So in particular, we developed uh, a, couple, uh, a couple of tools for uh, semi-automatic uh, area selection of each of the objects. So in this case, what we would like to obtain is something like a tool where the operator just select with, uh, with, a, left, uh, with a left click of, uh, of the mouse any of the pixel of the object. And then the tool should automatically find uh, whatever are the borders of the object. Okay, so this is the idea. Um, so here you can see an example on how it works. You should see that the, in this case, the user just selected, do I have a pointer here? Yeah. So you see that here the user just uh, have just selected a point inside of the object and uh, the tool automatically selected the borders of the object. So in, in such a way to ease uh, the labeling, the segmentation and labeling of the object. Okay, fine. So how this thing can work? Well, we have uh, uh, developed a couple of different ways in order to do it. Uh, but before describing the ways, uh, let's just focus on a couple of assumptions. So we, we assume that the user, as we have already said, just select a point inside of the object. And the other assumption that we're making is that the user also uh, properly set, has already properly set in some way, uh, the size of a searching window. Okay, so we do know that the object should have a maximum size in a certain sense. Okay, around the, the point that we have selected. Uh, and also, obviously, for what concerns what we have already said, we also assume that in some way we can distinguish the object by means of, uh, of its multispectral characteristics from uh, whatever is around it. Okay, fine. So 
we have implemented, as I told you, a couple of ways to do it. The first is just based on the OTSU, some OTSU method for uh, segmenting, actually, in this case. Uh, this is pretty simple, I guess, that uh, most of you have uh, already heard about it. So let's try to describe it in a minute. So what we're going to do, let's focus just on using one channel. Uh, you may imagine that there are many ways in order to combine the information from different channels, but for simplicity, for the sake of simplicity in this, presenta in this presentation, let's just focus on the case in which we are just considering one channel. So in this case, we are just going to um, compute an histogram of intensities inside of this image, okay, on the channel that we are considering, in particular inside of a searching window. And what we, are, what we would like to find is in some way an optimal threshold for these intensities in such a way to distinguish between uh, the two kind of components that we are expecting. So we are expecting to see two components, one related to the object. So you see here we have a multimodal distribution, obviously, where one of the modes is related to the object and the other one is supposed to be related to the background in this case. We would like to, dis to distinguish between the two of them and in order to define in some way an optimal threshold to distinguish the two of them, uh, we are going to search for it in such a way to minimize the uh, intravariance between each of the two classes, okay? So inside of each of the two classes, we would like to minimize this intravariance. Uh, since we are considering just two classes, this is equivalent in some way also to maximize the interclass variance. So that is probably not really so, so important, but the point is that in some way, we would like to minimize, if you prefer, the dispersion around the mean of each of the two, um, of each of the two distribution that you are going to consider in this case. So this is pretty simple, as you might have imagined. So uh, this is just the first way that we have used. The other one is instead based uh, on graph, it's based on graph-based segmentation. In this case, we have just implemented the normalized cats, the normalized cats, sorry. Um, uh, so in this case, we are just going to consider a graph where each of the pixels inside of a searching window is going to be a node of a graph. So let's try to uh, see the graph. So this is clearly uh, just a simple graph in order to have an idea about what's, uh, what's happening. And in particular, for each of the edges between the nodes, we are going to define a weight. Uh, this weight is related to the similarity of the values of the node. Okay, uh, so in particular, what we can, what is possible to show is that in order to make uh, this kind of computation work, this kind of weight is going to be, sm the smaller is this way, the more different are the two pixels that we are considering, the two nodes that we are considering, okay? Uh, okay, fine, so what we would like to find is uh, something like a cut, Okay, so you see in uh, this red line is actually cutting the graph in two parts where we are distinguishing in, an, in the kind of problem that we are considering, we are distinguishing between the object of our interest and the rest of the, of the searching window. So in some sense, let's talk about the rest as something like a background. Uh, so uh, a way in order to define this kind of, to compute this kind of, uh, of cut may be, for example, that of minimizing the weights that we are, the weights of the edges that we are cutting, okay? So let's sum, for example, all of the, the weights of all of the edges that we are cutting with this kind of line. And a first way in order to do it may be that, uh, let's say also a quite naive way in order to do it, is that of trying to minimize the sum of these weights, okay? Uh, this is quite reasonable, but unfortunately, this, tri this tends to, uh, in some way, favors uh, the, generation, the, the generation of quite small regions, okay, which is not really our case. So we would like to make something 
which, uh, which is not uh, affected by this kind of issue. So in order to make it in, a, to make it in some sense, uh, to make it in a more fair way, so not depending on, uh, on the area of, uh, of the region that we are segmenting, we are going to consider the normalized cut. In the case of the normalized cut, we are just considering this kind of functional to be minimized. Uh, Okay, fine. Uh, the good thing uh, in this kind of uh, procedure is that actually it can be shown, you can find the details in this paper. Uh, this kind of problem can be, can be actually reposed uh, as uh, the computation of uh, eigenvalues, uh, of uh, eigenvalues and eigenvector of this kind, oh, on this kind of equation, sorry in this kind of equation. And so the only thing that we really do need, the, the most important thing that we really do need to do is computing the eigenvector of this kind of equation. In particular, what we are really interested to, it's just the eigenvector associated to the second smallest eigenvalue. Okay, fine. Uh, in addition to, to what I told you, we have also developed another tool which actually tries to exploit the results from previous images, because as I told you, since we are acquiring images with, uh, with a UAV, with a UAS, uh, we have that uh, um, successive images are quite similar to each other, okay? And we would like in some way to exploit this kind of information. So what we're going to do in this case is that of uh, assuming that the images are acquired uh, uh, that the camera is actually oriented in, uh, in an ideal orientation, and uh, we also assume that some navigation data are, are available. From these kind of, from these two kind of, uh, of information, we can exploit this information in order to define a proper searching window to find a previously find object in the next images. Okay, so it's not that uh, the, such a difficult thing. You can see here that the objects are moving. Here you are directly looking at the masks, okay? At the binary masks. And what we are looking at is just, uh, uh, you see that we have defined uh, the, the searching windows and so on. And in particular, uh, you can also imagine that we have, um, you may also try to develop different tools in order to distinguish which ones uh, uh, of, the, mm, of the areas inside of the, of the searching window are those corresponding to the real object. In our case, we developed, uh, we implemented um, some kind of comparison based actually on uh, descriptors, on feature descriptors. And here you can see what we found as uh, the best, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, medium point, the centroid actually of a new uh, plastic positions uh, in the new image. You see that now you are directly looking at uh, some, uh, some of the bands uh, of a real image acquired by our drone. Okay, for what concerns the classification instead is something that we are still working about it. So classification for now it's uh, mostly, yeah, I've finished it. It's just based on uh, the manual selection of the object and uh, just the manual selection can be propagated also in the way that you have just seen by means of this kind of, uh, of tool. But for now it's mostly manual. We're going to work a little bit more uh, in our future development of, on this step. So this is just to conclude. Uh, you have just seen uh, the kind of tool that we have developed in order to support the segmentation of images. Uh, and clearly, it's something that we are still developing, so on uh, the foreseen future work, you see that there are still a couple of steps that we are planning to do, hopefully quite soon. This is all. Thank you.